Hey y'all, it's Brittany and welcome back to my channel. This week's installment, y'all, is another recommendation from one of y'all. So shout out to y'all for hitting me with all these recommendations and cases to research. Y'all have been on point bomb with these stories. Today's story is all about Anthony Sowell, better known as the Cleveland Strangler. Now, this is another African-American serial killer. We don't get a ton of coverage on those serial killers that happen to be African-American. Um, a lot of the times because they are killing within their own communities, the poorer, you know, less fortunate communities. But I wanted to shed some light on this case. Thank you for recommending it. This is a person who raped strangled and murdered 11 women within a span of two years from 2007 to 2009 and y'all he could have been stopped so many times so if y'all want to hear all about this story the victims and how this case ended stay tuned <laughs> So my skin is already prepped and ready to go, followed my skincare routine. If y'all want to, you know, do some skincare stuff with me and not always makeup, let me know in those comments down below. We can do something like snapped in skincare. I can cover shorter cases like snapped. Just trying to throw out some different ideas to kind of keep it juicy, keep it spicy on this channel. But if you want to know about my skincare routine, I do have a video. Otherwise, let me know and I can do some cases, some get ready with me's with skincare instead of makeup. But anywho, y'all. So, of course, the first thing I'm going to do is apply my primer. And the primer that I'm going to be using today, I am going to try out the Marc Jacobs primer. And this is the Undercover They're Blurring Coconut Face Primer. And then I also picked up these two new brow products from Kosas. And the first one was the Airbrow Fluff and Hold Treatment Gel. And the other one is the Kosas Brow Pop. And this is their Dual Action Defining Brow Pencil. So I'm going to try both of those out on the brows today. Look at this packaging, y'all. This is so cute. Now, Anthony Sowell grew up in East Cleveland during the 50s and the 60s. And this period of time was where you had a lot of people, including his family, coming from the South and trying to build better lives for themselves up North. So there was a promise of things like, you know, good manufacturing jobs and that kind of thing. And that's really what drew people like his family into places like East Cleveland, Ohio. Now, as a child, his family said that he was kind of a timid kid in school, a little bit socially awkward, um, but he was a different person at home, it seemed to be. So at home, he was a very aggressive kid towards his siblings and his other female relatives. And... I think a lot of that had to do with his family structure and the family dynamic. He didn't have any leading male figures, like a father figure or anything like that in his family, in his household, his immediate household. But he did have some male relatives who were abusive, who were you know physically abusive, sexually abusive to women and the younger children, female children in his family. So he followed that same path as a child. When you're shown things like that as a child, you think that's okay. So that's what he did as a child. It was reported by family members that he sexually abused his cousins, his female cousins um, from a very young age as a kid. So already we're starting off with really, really, really poor foundation to build an upstanding citizen within the community. Now, as Anthony grew up, the neighborhood started to decline. Those jobs that were once there and promised, you know, a solid foundation for families in the area were starting to fade out. They were, businesses were starting to close down and, you know, things like 
drugs and gangs were starting to infiltrate the community. So in order to escape that, he joined the Marines. Now in the Marines is when Anthony did really well. So he seemed to need and thrive off of structured environments coming from a home that was not structured you know all types of things were happening within the home and then being able to go into the marines where you're told basically how to live pretty much every minute of the day or for the most part of the day i think that is really what he thrived in and we'll see that kind of come up later too as well but he really needed structure he really did well with structure and without that he kind of fell apart now, in 1985, when he was honorably discharged from the Marines, like I said, he returned back to East Cleveland and it was in even worse shape than it was when he left. So at this point, drug infested and crack infested neighborhood. We all know about you know, the crack epidemic and how it impacted our black communities, especially our lower income black communities. Um, so this was one of those communities that was hit really hard by the crack epidemic and also gangs. Now I'm going to clean up my brows with my NARS Soft Matte Complete Concealer. After he got home and um, realized that things weren't as good as he thought they were going to be, he was reported to have actually raped a woman who had been pregnant at the time, but the case for some reason was never prosecuted, but his second victim since being home from the Marines was prosecuted. His, her case was prosecuted. Now this crime took place in 1989 and it was when he mel met a woman by the name of Melvet Sockwell. He met her on the street and he, she mentioned that he pretended to be trying to help her with her car. He took her back to his place, probably, you know, pr promising like, oh, you can come back, hang out, party, whatever. And he ended up torturing her and raping her. And she, of course, reported this attack to the police. Now, he was prosecuted for this and he was actually offered a plea bargain. So he was offered a plea bargain of up to 15 years in prison and having to register as a sex offender if he took the plea and pled guilty, which he did. So he did spend 15 years in prison for attacking Melvet Sockwell. Just a quick plug on these Kosas products, y'all. Like my brow, look at that. This brow looks so natural, so fluffy, not a harsh brow whatsoever. And by the way, Kosas is a great clean beauty brand. So I would say thumbs up to these two brow products, y'all. Thumbs up. Look at this brow. Who business you in? Now, in 2005, he was released from prison after serving 15 years for attacking Melvet. And unfortunately, they never actually entered his DNA. And we had DNA by this time, y'all. He never had his DNA entered into any type of database to keep track of him. Now they did have him, they did have him register as a sex offender, but they didn't take a sample of his DNA whatsoever. Now I'm gonna color correct really quick with my Born This Way concealer. Now, after he was released out of prison, he he would do okay for a little while when you know he had work and he had something that he could be doing structurally and he had the home structure of having a girlfriend and things like that. He did well, like I said, with structure. Just like in prison, they said he was a model prisoner and caused no trouble, structure fits him well. When he has no structure, all hell breaks loose. When he broke up with his girlfriend around 2007 is when again that structure started to fall away from him and he stopped going to work and got fired because he stopped showing up for work and he also started to drink and he started to use drugs at that time as well now i'm going to take another new product that i picked up from sephora recently during the vip sale and that is the one size turn up the base 
foundation powder. So we'll see how this matches. I bought this and matched this prior to going on vacation and we'll see if the color still matches. If not, we will make it work. In June of 2007, Solo met a woman, Crystal Dozier. And Crystal was a mother of seven. And unfortunately she was also drug addicted. She was addicted to crack cocaine and she was in, you know, the street life. She basically did, you know, whatever she needed to do to feed her habit and, you know, keep herself alive. So well, actually met her on the streets. He offered, you know, for her to come back to his place and hang out, drink, do a little drugs, that kind of thing. And of course she was all for it. She was a drug addict. What would you expect? Y'all, this is beautiful coverage. This is beautiful. Beautiful. Very skin-like. This is beautiful. So after inviting her back to his place to drink and smoke, Sowell proceeded to rape her, beat her, and strangle her. And her family reported her missing. She was never seen again after that day. Now I'm going to do some facial brightening with my Dose of Colors concealer. Around this same time, the people of the community started to smell a real foul smell, y'all. Real foul. And they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. So they complained and they complained and they complained. And finally, health inspectors came out. And of course, across the street on each corner of the street, across the street from Anthony Soul's home, there was a corner store or a convenience store and there was a sausage company so the first time health inspectors came out of course everybody started to blame the corner store now we all know the stigmas and the stereotypes that come with being an arab in america things ignorant things like oh they smell like things like that is some of the stereotypes that you get being of Middle Eastern descent coming to America, you have your own cultures, your own values, that kind of thing. So of course, people in that community were ignorant and they were saying, oh, it's the Arab that owns the corner store. He's the reason why everything smells. Knowing full well, that is not what it was. Something that foul that smelled up the entire community just seems so ridiculous to be trying to blame it on a person and their cultural beliefs and all of that kind of stuff. So that is what they tried to pawn it off on when they first started to smell the scent of just stank in the East Cleveland community. Year later, June 2008, another woman by the name of Tashana Culver goes missing within the East Cleveland community as well. And she's also reported missing to the police of East Cleveland. But I hope y'all are noticing a pattern of me saying she was reported missing and nothing following that because nothing followed that. Now, after she goes missing, the health inspectors come out again because there's more complaints about the scent in the neighborhood. Now this time, instead of them blaming it on the Arabs in the community, they say, okay, there's a sausage company. Why did I just say sausage like that? There's a sausage company right here. So that has to be what it is. So the health inspectors assumed that it was coming from the sausage company. Now the sausage company ended up having to spend over $200,000 on upgrades to their ventilation system because of course, if the health inspectors come out and say, you're not ventilating correctly, this is what's causing the stink in the community and you need to change it for the people in the community. And they're going to do what they're told to do in order to stay in business, in order to stay profitable at some point. And they spend all this money to update their ventilation system, thinking that they're the ones that are like causing this smell in their community. And then I'm also going to take my Fenty Beauty Skin Stick and Caviar and deepen my cheekbone area of just a smidge. Now in 2008, 
Anthony Sowell meets a woman by the name of Vanessa Gay. Now, y'all know I like to just key all in on, you know, the background a little bit of some of these victims, where these people come from, and everybody doesn't start off with, you know, a horrible upbringing, a horrible life. It's a lot of times it's just a series of unfortunate events that take place for these people who find themselves in these situations or live in these lifestyles that we, you know, see and we talk about in these true crime stories. Vanessa was as a child, very smart, very into school. She was a straight A student, as a matter of fact, for you know much of her school career. She was even at some point in the honor society at school and you know lived a normal life all the way up until her 30s she lived in that area in in you know an impoverished area but she wanted to keep her focus on you know school and not being one of those people that she saw on the street as a kid growing up and unfortunately that's just what happened to her around her 30s is where her life started to falter and she actually left home voluntarily she was a mom you know she had a good family around her but she left because she did not want her family to think that what was going on and what was happening to her was normal that's a lot of the problems a lot of times within you know especially the black community or communities where we have those low income impoverished areas regardless of race those impoverished impoverished areas we see a lot of normalizing things like drug use and gang activity and normalizing things that should not be considered normal in a in a family structure or in your life period so at the very least she felt like she should remove herself from the situation so that it didn't become something that was okay for her kids something that was normal and expected for her kids so while you know people on drugs do a lot of crazy things and we know that but at least kudos to her for removing herself to you know not further scar her children or you know change their outlook on life any further than it already had been done now i'm going to set my under eye area with my laura mercier translucent powder and then i'm going to set the rest of my face um especially where I applied the cream product. I'm going to set that with some translucent deep Laura Mercier powder. Now, when Solo met her, he, you know, pulled the same routine, the same charming routine, you know, invited her over to his place to smoke, to drink. And of course she obliged. As soon as they made it to his house, he punched her in the face and then told her to get undressed, forced her to undress. And he repeatedly raped this woman over and over again. She managed to escape and she did go to the police. Now, back in 2008, and I say back in like it was a long time ago, but it really wasn't. The East Cleveland police had no standard procedure for how to take the statements of rape victims, processing kids, any of that stuff. So they went and told her she needed to come in to report her attack. Now, first of all, this woman is a drug addict. So they were disregarding her anyway. But asking someone to come in after they've been brutally attacked and come tell you about it when you already sound like you don't care on the phone about what just happened. And you know, they know, everybody knows what the police, especially in these types of areas, think of drug addicts and people that are just in impoverished communities, impoverished communities period we already know what the stigma is of that and she had to you know embarrass her she was already embarrassed by being attacked in such a way but having to go and tell them all over again and risk them not even caring when she told her story so she you know felt embarrassed she felt like she was not going to get any help 
and she just didn't go through with reporting. Now, actually, had they taken her seriously when she called, a lot of these women would still be alive today. He still had, you know, he had still a full a full year of activity after this happened, and this really brings to light again kind of the treatment and the view that the police had on the communities that they serve. Not taking these claims seriously or the case seriously just because of her living situation and you know what she was does not give you the right to decide whether or not you're going to take a case or take it seriously or look into it at the very least. Now I'm going to bronze with my Revolution Glow bronzer. Now in October 2008, following Vanessa's attack, a woman by the name of Michelle Mason is reported missing. Now after that, in November of 2008, a woman by the name of Tonya Carmichael goes missing as well. Now, her family also reports her as missing to the police. They actually had the nerve to tell her, we know her. We know that she's a drug addict. So just wait. Whenever she's done on her drug binge, she'll come home. Just wait for her. So, of course, just like all of the other families, they had to turn to the community to try to find their missing family member. So they handed out flyers. They, you know, asked around. But that was pretty much it. Now... December 2008, a woman by the name of Gladys Wade met Anthony Soule. And actually, this was a little bit different than the others. It was said that he met her outside near the corner store uh, right across the street from his house. And he actually attacked her outside and drug her into his home. And when he did that, he beat her inside his home, but she fought back. She fought to get free. And when she finally got free, the woman had gone through a glass pane door to get out. That's, she was doing whatever she needed to do to get free. Once she did, she ran to a restaurant. It was like a pizza place or something like that across the street from his house. And she gets there and she's begging somebody to call the police, begging somebody for help, some of the employees. And they're laughing and they're telling her, you know, we don't want anything to do with it. You need to leave because you're getting blood all over our floor. And again, this is a lot of what you see in the, you know, lower income communities, the impoverished communities, the minority communities, because that's usually what it is. You see not only the police not caring about the community that they serve, not all, I will say not all, there are some police out there that really do gener genuinely care about the communities that they're serving. But what we also see, and you know, me personally, I've grown up in impoverished communities as a child. And one like majority black communities or majority minority communities as a child. And you experience these things firsthand. You have people and business owners who want to capitalize off of your community because they're selling things that cater to your community, like the food that we like to eat or the things that we like to buy, beauty supplies, all the above. Now, I know if you are a minority and you've walked into a beauty supply store, you've been followed you've been questioned, you've been told that your purse needs to remain closed in the store. And those are the things that we experience. You have these people who wanna capitalize off of our communities, but could care less. And half the time they're afraid of the community that they serve. So on one hand, you have people that are in power that don't want to serve the community or don't care to serve the community. They're there to just collect their paycheck. And then on the other hand, you have these people that want to make money off of us, but they're afraid of us at the same time or mistrusting of us and just want to capitalize. It, like, it's just so messed up. These communities and the structures and the things that are in these communities, it's just, it's so disheartening. Since she got zero assistance from the people who worked with in the restaurant, she decided, okay, I'm just going to have to flag down a patrol officer. So she was able to actually flag down a patrol car 
and there was two officers and she's bleeding everywhere. She's gone through, you know, a glass door. She had lacerations and abrasions all over her body. And she tells them what happened. She tells them where to go. And they actually go, they check it out. They see that he's beat up too. Anthony Sowell is beat up as well. And there's disarray all over the house, blood all over the house, broken glass. And there is clear evidence that what she is saying is true, regardless of who she is, regardless of what she is doing with her life or the lifestyle that she is leading at the time. These police, they go, there is evidence that says what she's saying is accurate. What she's saying is true. So they arrest him right then and there. They arrest him and a case is filed and the case is handed over to the sex crime units, specifically a detective by the name of Georgia Hussein. And now I'm gonna be using my Modern Renaissance palette by Anastasia Beverly Hills to do a quick eye look. Now, it was reported that Miss Hussein, the detective from Sex Crimes, she took it upon herself that when she went to go visit the prosecutor to, you know, move forward with charges or figure out if they had enough evidence or whatever to move forward with charges against Anthony Solo, she decides that she's only gonna present a robbery charge to the prosecutor. She didn't even bother to present the assault, the battery, or the sexual assault to the prosecutor to be approved for charges. How? When you read the report, it says that there was insufficient evidence, there was no sign of attack, and the claims were basically baseless, non-found, like they were unfounded claims. And I'm just so confused by that because if the patrol officers went, they saw this woman beat up, bleeding everywhere. They went to this man's home and saw that clearly there had been a violent attack that took place here. There is blood everywhere. Where are the claims unfounded? And it was because they felt that Gladys Wade, living the lifestyle that she lived, wasn't a trustworthy witness. Like, I can't even. Like, I just, y'all. So after this happened and they didn't move forward with charges on assault, rape, any of that, they released him to go home pending the robbery charges. And the detective even decided that she was going to visit him in his home. And sis said, you know, she didn't smell anything, didn't notice anything strange at all. How, how, how? So because all of this was just kind of thrown by the wayside. His rampage continued. And in January of 2009, he murdered Kim Smith. Later on in 2009, April of 2009, he murdered Nancy Cobb. And there was also another report of a rape against him. A woman came in and reported a rape against him around the same time. They took a rape kit and they did nothing with it. Shortly after that, Amelda Hunter goes missing. And in June of 2009, Janice Webb goes missing. Later on in June, Talisha Forston also goes missing. Her family reported her missing. And this family, her mom actually followed up after she filed the missing persons report. She would call the police, ask them what's going on with the case, any progress going on with the case. Nobody knew what she was talking about because nobody was working on the case. So these missing person reports were just piling up and piling up on somebody's desk in somebody's folder, but no one worked the actual cases because of who these women were, because they were drug addicts, because they were prostitutes. Nobody cared. Now, a couple months after that, September, 2009, Diane Turner goes missing. Okay guys, so I am going to put on my magnetic lashes and I will be right back.
Okay guys, lashes and eyes are done. So now I am going to put on my blush and I'm going to be using Later the very same month, September 2009, the sheriff's department, as like they are supposed to do, they came to visit him because he has standing visits because he's a sex offender, came to visit. Again, nobody smells anything. Nobody reports or notices anything when they come visit this man. That very same day, he invites Latundra Phillips to his home to smoke and drink per usual. And as soon as he get there, she gets hit in the face. He hits her in the face. And he, again, like he always did, he raped her and he strangled her as he was raping her. Now, she actually managed to escape and she reported this to the police as well. And they took the case, they took the report and they referred the case to sex crimes again, but no one ever bothered to go talk to Anthony so well about this incident at all. Now, a month later, Sean Morris in October is gone. You know, she went through the same play by play as all these other women invited over to Anthony's house to smoke and drink, have a good time. And he attacks her as well. And this time she jumps out of a second floor window. I am going to take my Becca chocolate geode highlighter and you know, touch it up a little bit in a few areas. This part of the story is just crazy y'all because when she jumps out of that window and hits the ground, so there's just a little like walkway with some grass on the side of the building. Right across the street is like I said, the Ray's Sausage Company. Now Ray's Sausage Company has surveillance cameras and this whole ordeal is caught on camera and on top of that, there was a witness out there that saw this whole thing happen. So she jumps out of his second story window to get away from him because she knew that he was going to try to kill her. He jumps out of the window, hits the ground, and there's a man standing there that sees all of this going down. And this woman that jumps out of the window that he sees jump out of the window is completely naked she is not moving she is bloody and after he sees this woman he sees anthony sowell come out behind her just naked naked both of them just naked anthony proceeds to tell this young man who's witnessing all this happen he proceeds to say you know clean version, as clean as I can be. We were having sex and you know, things got a little rough and she fell out of the window. What? What, sir? And obviously the person who witnessed everything wasn't buying it either. Thank God he wasn't buying that either. The bystander, the witness, he calls 911 and he tells them, you know, this woman just jumped out the window and she's bleeding everywhere. She's barely moving. She can't speak. And there's this naked man out here with her too, trying to say they're together, but this don't seem right. So the ambulance comes, they come to help the woman who's fallen out of the window. And Anthony is still trying to sell the same story that they're, boyfriend and girlfriend that's his woman or now at this point he's a her husband and you know what happened is they they got a little rough so when they actually get to the hospital he changes his story a little bit when they're talking to police now he goes with her like he is following this story all the way through y'all he is selling this story he goes with her to the emergency room and he starts to talk to the police. Of course, her attacker is there with her, so she's afraid to talk to the police. And he tries to tell the same story. This is my my wife, whatever. Nobody, like, cut it out. So 
She's in the hospital for three days, three days before she's able to go home. She, in an interview, she had mentioned, you know, she woke up at one point in the hospital and she was like, you know, I need to call my husband. I need to call my husband. And she said, the nurse said, ma'am, your husband is here. And she said, that is not my husband. Now, once she actually got home, he actually contacted her after she got out of the hospital and, and basically threatened her life saying that if she go to the police, that he would kill her, which is what he planned to do in the first place anyway. So obviously after she was threatened, she didn't follow through with reporting it to the police. They reached out to her and she said, it didn't happen, nothing happened, leave me alone. Now I am going to take my Fenty Gloss Bomb Cream and Mauve Wives. So now is the point where the sex crime units finally decides to do something with the Latundra Billups case because she mentioned to them in the case a month prior in her complaint that she had left some personal effects there. Her underwear were there. There was proof that she was there. So when they make up their mind to actually do their jobs at some point, they take the SWAT team and they go to Anthony Soel's house. And what they find in this man's home is just completely unspeakable, unbelievable, unfathomable. So they go into his house. There is rat feces everywhere. There are rat droppings everywhere you step, all over the floor. You look up, there's flies, Hank, just every, just disgusting. How someone lived in those conditions, I will never understand. They go upstairs, they find two bodies, just of two women, just there. Like out in the open, not trying to be hidden, just there. They find two more bodies. One was in a crawl space, but they find four bodies total upstairs. They go downstairs into his basement and under the stairs, they find a mound of dirt, but this is not like when you've like, like jackhammered up the concrete of your basement and now you're in the dirt of the basement. This is on top of the concrete in the basement. They find this pile of dirt, this mound of dirt under the stairs. As they remove the dirt, they find a fifth body. There is a red bucket near the stairs as well. There is a human skull inside of this bucket. That is six people they have now found deceased inside the home. So now obviously they need to check outside. They need to check everywhere. Mind you, there has been a stench in this neighborhood for two years. And I've never personally smelled a decomposing body or the smell of death, but from everything I've read, everything I've heard, it's, a very unique scent, something that you cannot mistake for anything else. So to have this smell for two years and you blame it on a person or a sausage company, I don't understand. People have visited this man's home, people being authorities, Detectives, sheriffs have visited this man's home and never once mentioned the stench. Nothing. Have never checked his home outside of just making sure he was there and fine and he's getting a parole, like his sex offender check. You, I would think that you would walk the home something. Now, I don't know what, exactly what they do, but if you're coming to check on a sex offender, I'm not just meeting them at the door, right? You just wouldn't meet them at the door. But nobody noticed anything. And when they go to check his yard, they find five more bodies. 
That is a total of 11 women that this man has murdered on his premises and kept them all and allowed them to decay and rot in or on his premises. I can't even begin to comprehend how this happened. As police start to talk to him, interrogate him, he starts to try to blame it on things like, oh, voices. And I have vague memories of these attacks, but they're all dreams to me. None of this really makes sense to me. This doesn't feel real. It was all a dream. None of this feels like it really happened. But at the same time, he's giving commentary on each and every victim, how he was able to get them to his home and what happened. And obviously the detectives are not falling for that, oh, it was the voices, the voices made me do it story. We talked about last week how mental health plays a role in you know some of these cases, but this was not one of them. He was just using that as a way to get out of what he had done. Now, needless to say, he was convicted of these heinous, heinous crimes. And he was sentenced to death in 2011. Now, after all of this came out and he went to prison, he's sentenced to death, they finally tore down that house. So now that house is a vacant lot. And over the years they've planned or the city has planned to do things with this specific plot of land, but nothing has been done. No memorials have been put up for those fallen victims. And the houses around there, for the most part, are empty because no one wants to live in that area just because so many bad things happened on that street around that home. So unfortunately, it's just a vacant lot sitting there. And also in terms of the victims and the families, I'm like... I'm so tired of hearing about how within our communities, the black communities, the communities of minorities, the communities of the less fortunate, the impoverished, how we're supposed to have these people and, you know, these public servants in place to help us, regardless of our situation, regardless of what we look like, regardless of how much money we have in the bank. We deserve to be protected just as anyone else deserves to be protected. So I'm just so tired of hearing about these stories where these killers can get away with killing in these communities because the people who are supposed to care about us don't. And because they dismiss the claims that are reported to them because of what somebody looks like or because of a job that somebody doesn't have. This is the type of thing that just, it irks my soul, y'all. It irks my soul. And I did a little research and um, looking into like the families and because you hope these families, when the case is over and he's gone to jail and he gets his death sentence, you hope these families have some type of closure. And you also hope that these families are able to heal from something like this. And I just found that it felt like these families were never helped or given the tools they needed in order to heal. A conviction does not equal healing. These families were, you know, people who lost a mother, a daughter. There was almost every one of these, if not every one of these women were mothers of multiple small children. So these kids, They don't understand why something happened. A lot of the times when you talk to kids, a lot of the times they think it's their fault when bad things happen. And that was the case for some of these families as well. So you have these kids who are not being helped, who are not getting counseling, who are not healing from losing their mother, no matter what type of mother she was. They still lost a mother. And I even found that one of the children even tried to commit suicide because he felt so bad that he felt that it was his fault that what happened to his mom happened. And this is the issue that I have. These families had talked to, you know, the the 
government of, you know, their community, the people who govern their community. And there were all these promises made of, you know, we'll get you what you need. Even there's money that's set aside so that these families could put headstones for these women who were murdered. These families still haven't seen the money for the headstones. Some of these grave sites don't have a headstone. <sighs> Y'all. This, this makes me so sad because usually when I'm telling these stories, I, I really, you know, say, you know, I hope that people have gotten closure and healing. And a lot of times you find these articles and, you know, documentaries and all these different things that, you know, you have those family members that are saying, yes, I received, I, this was our closure. This is what we needed. But that's not what happened in this case. And that is so unfortunate and so sad. And it was so hard to watch one of the documentaries that I watched on this um, because that is one of my forms of research. But one of my documentary, the documentaries that I watched, there was a police officer who actually said from this community that worked this case and was in touch with these families. And it was so disheartening for him to say that. And what he said was, a lot of promises are made to the inner city. Promises are always made to the inner city and never kept. And that's so sad. That is so sad. All right, y'all. I wish I could have ended that on a lighter note. Um, at least I'm hoping that at the very least, the sentence was some form of justice. Not closure, but justice. I know they're wishing for some of the other people within law enforcement who kind of let these cases fall by the wayside. They want to see them answer as well, but at least getting the actual killer behind bars is some form of justice. Now, this is also the final look. Yes, Sheba is still out. I am letting her breathe. So just bask in all of her glory that is all natural. But this is my final look. I was feeling real rosy today, real soft today is how I was feeling. So I went for kind of a, a rosy mauve look today and I really do like it. I feel like it looks natural. If you have not noticed, I am a fan of natural, soft, feminine looks. So that's what I do. I'm all about making sure that complexion is on point and then adding, you know, some chef's kiss touches on top of that. So this is what I got today, y'all. I am loving the look. And I also hope that you enjoyed the story. But let me know in the comments down below what you thought of this story. I know some people are not as familiar with him. Some people are. People who are really deep into true crime have probably heard of this story before. And a lot of people have not. So I felt like this was a good mix of serial killer and unknown case. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Let me know either way, if you did or not, in those comments down below. And let me know what you think of today's look. And finally, y'all, if you have not already, make sure you subscribe, okay? I cover it all. It's not just about true crime, although we all love true crime. That's what we're here for, right? But I also like to talk about, you know, I also have videos where I'm talking about the makeup products that I'm going to be using in my true crime videos and my skincare routine sometimes whenever I update that. And also I do a lot of... um luxury videos, specifically fragrances. So if you're into fragrances and you want to learn more about those types of things, I'm here for you for that too. And I'll also be growing my hair section of my videos as well. I'm looking to do a ton more of the natural hair videos and kind of protective styling videos that aren't always wigs. I do do a lot of wigs, but I will be introducing some other styles. So make sure y'all stay tuned and just subscribe y'all. You don't want to miss out. And then make sure you like the video. Let me know that you enjoy what I'm putting out to you guys. Otherwise y'all, 
until next time, it's been fun. It's been so real. Love you guys. Bye.